Okay, so our talk is about unembedded indirect discourse. Um, so I start, there's a debate in, uh, in, in narratology about when and where and how free indirect discourse, the literary style of free and known as free indirect discourse, how it, uh, it in first emerged. So on the one side of the debate, there's, there's uh, classical scholars and, uh, and literary scholars who say that free indirect is very old. Like here's a quote from the Handbook of Narratology, but it's an article by Brian McHill. Free indirect discourse, though already present in ancient Greek and Latin literature and in biblical narrative, would not be identified until the last decades of the 19th century. So they say it's very old. And on the other side of the debate, there's, uh, for instance, the, the, the eminent linguist and the literary scholar Anne Banfield who wrote a book about free indirect discourse. And she says the opposite. The claim that instances of the style can be found in Greek and Latin finds little credence. So that's free indirect discourse. And no plausible examples have been proffered to uh, support this claim. Okay. So we want to contribute to this debate. And we'll get back to it uh, uh, in the end. But first, so to, 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 to get clear on what we're talking about, first let me explain what free and direct discourse is. So it's a way of reporting what someone said or thought, and it's best explained in contrast with uh, the, the normal ways of reporting what someone said or thought. So direct discourse, so it's a bit of context. Two weeks later, she was getting ready to leave Paris. Uh, Hooray, tomorrow I'll be home and I'll never have to see this place again, she thought to herself. A direct discourse report of what she was thinking. We can report the same thing in indirect discourse. She thought to herself that she'd be home the next day and that she'd never have to see that place again. A different linguistic method of reporting the same thought. And then this is the free indirect discourse version. Hooray, tomorrow she'd be home and she'd never have to see this place again, she thought to herself. So it looks, it, it looks like it has a little bit of both. So it looks like, uh, like direct discourse for instance, in the, the behavior of uh, non-pronominal indexicals, so real indexicals like tomorrow or this, they are retained from the, or they're like copies of the original, what she was literally thinking. So they're same as indirect discourse. But it also has some elements of indirect discourse. So for instance, pronouns and tenses are, are typically uh, uh, adjusted to the reporting environment. So you see, instead of I, you, you have she in free indirect discourse as in indirect discourse. Okay, so to sum up what we saw there, pronouns and tenses behave as in indirect discourse, non-pronominal indexicals behave as in direct discourse. Bit of a mix. Well, there's of course many more things to look at, uh, and then the, the picture gets, it gets more complicated, but research so far, but semanticists have shown, for instance, expressive elements, epithets, or derae possibilities, uh, particles, tend to always behave as if in, in direct discourse, when they occur in free indirect discourse. So this, there's this, this double nature, some aspects of direct, some aspects of indirect. So there's also a couple of theories on the market today about how to analyze them. And this debate is also far from settled and we'll also hope to contribute to this debate a little bit. Um, so there's, for instance, these analysis of double context uh, dependence analysis of uh, Philip Schlenker. Um, so he says in a, in a narrative, he's following Banfield, there's two types of context dependence. There's, there's, uh, you, so you evaluate semantically with respect to two contexts, not just the actual context. There's the, the context of the story centered on the protagonist, that's little c. And there's the context, uh, so this is the version of Regina Eckert, and there's the context of the narrator, the person who's writing the story. So, and then uh, there's two types of indexicals. So regular indexicals like tomorrow are to be evaluated with respect to little c, the protagonist context, and uh, she, uh, pronouns are to be evaluated with respect to the big C, the narrator context. So there's a very different analysis by uh, Yael Sharvit. Uh, and she says, um, she, she tries to assimilate free indirect discourse to regular indirect discourse. So she says, um, well, she uses, to do that, she uses a, a monstrous operator that uh, quantifies over context. And then there's a, a, a bound indexical which, which has its features deleted by feature deletion under agreement or something like that. And then there's an, a, a very different analysis uh, that I've proposed in terms of quotation. It says that, well, you really should analyze it not as Charvetus as a form of indirect discourse, but as a form of direct discourse, a form of quotation with unquotation for the pronouns and the tenses. 
So the question really is where does free and discourse fit in in this classical picture of uh, what is reported speech? So classically we say, well, there's two ways to report what someone said or thought. There's a quotational way where you're quoting someone's words, that's direct discourse. And there's, uh, there's, uh, there's the indirect discourse way, where, which, which uses an intentional operator, where you're just reporting basically the content of, what someone, of someone's words. So where does free indirect discourse, so-called, uh, uh, fit in uh, in this, in this uh, classical dichotomy? So well, what we want to do today, not necessarily settle that debate, but to point out that although typically we think of indirect discourse indeed as, as an intentional uh, uh, construction, there's, there's always embedding semantically under an intentional operator and it's always syntactically uh, subordinated. But we want to point out that there's also a phenomenon, for instance in ancient Greek, that we call unembedded indirect discourse. And uh, we, we, we claim the crucial point is that we claim that this phenomenon, unembedded indirect discourse, is, is fundamentally distinct from free indirect discourse. So that in the end we'll conclude that free indirect discourse is a bit of a misnomer because this free stands for uh, yeah, independent, syntactically independent, so unembedded. Okay, so um, then Green will talk you through the data about ancient Greek and, and I'll get back with some analysis and Green will conclude. So let's start with some basic facts about ancient Greek. Ancient Greek has three ways to report an utterance in an indirect way. It can use a finite clause with a normal indicative mood, as in one. He said that he is writing. So a present tense because the language doesn't have sequence of tense. Or it can use a finite clause with a so-called optative mood, so a special mood. Or it can use an infinitival construction, as in three. So literally, he said to write, meaning he said that he was writing. And if the subject of the writing is the same as that of the saying, the language does not express, does not express the subject, as is this the case here. But if it's not the same, then it does express it, and it uses accusative case. So literally, we then have he said her to write, meaning he said that she was writing. Interestingly, when an author wants to report a longer discourse indirectly, he can continue to use the uh, indirectness marking, so that is either the optative mood or the accusative with infinitive mar uh, marking, so the ACI construction, for several sentences that are not embedded under a verb of saying. And we call this phenomenon unembedded indirect discourse. This is an example. So we have the Persian learned men say that the Phoenicians were the cause of the dispute. So we have a verb of saying. There's nothing strange so far and an accusative with definitive construction that depends on it. But then this construction continues for several sentences. And the verb of saying is not repeated. So it's added in the translation. In the English translation you have, they say. But it's just to indicate that the Greek text continues with this uh, accusative with definitive construction. And you can actually find the whole passage on your handout, since this, since this is only the beginning of the story that is told in this uh, construction. So, we do have a accusative with infinitive instruction, construction that indicates that we have to do a with, a with a report of what the Persian people said. But it does not depend on the verb of saying, which is mentioned only once at the beginning. And in fact, even an initial overt indirect speech embedding is not necessary. So a parenthetical say or even an implicit say may suffice. This is an example with a parenthetical say. Because of the great size of the city, those who dwell there say, the inhabitants of the middle part, accusative case, did not know in the infinitive that those in the outer parts of it were overcome. So we have a verb of saying, but it's used parenthetically. And the accusative with infinitive construction does not uh, depend on it syntactically, although it does indicate that we have to do with a report of what these people said. 
And this is an example where the saying is even implicit. So there's no explicit, explicit verb of saying at all here. So Atabatanus was the older, oldest of the earlier sons, Xerxes of the later, and as sons of different mothers, they were rivals. Artabazanus pleaded that he was the oldest of all Darius' offspring, and that it was everywhere customary that the eldest should rule. So again, uh, pleaded that he is added in the translation. It's only the optative that marks that we have to do with the report here. Xerxes argued that he was the son of Cyrus' daughter Atosa, and that it was Cyrus who had won the Persians their freedom. This phenomenon, which we call unembedded indirect discourse, shares some characteristics with free indirect discourse. It's reportive, it's syntactically unembedded, and pronouns behave as an indirect discourse rather than as in direct discourse. So that raises the question whether we have to do with free indirect discourse. So is unembedded indirect discourse a form of free indirect discourse? To answer that question, we need to get a clearer picture of what distinguishes free indirect discourse from indirect discourse. And we see that the two behave differently with several classes of linguistic expressions. For example, with non-phenomenal indexicals like tomorrow that Amo had in the, in the beginning of this talk. In free indirect discourse, such expressions are always protagonist oriented. So that means interpreted from the perspective of the character in the story. So from the reported speaker. Whereas in indirect discourse, these are always narrator-oriented, interpreted from the actual speaker. As for particles, these are uh, protagonist-oriented in free indirect discourse, as we see, for example, in Regina Eckert's work. Um, and we think that we do not yet dare to say anything conclusive about particles in indirect discourse. There is some research done in that area, but it may depend on the particle, and I think that more work needs to be done there. And as for exclamatives, these can occur in free indirect discourse, but they are impossible in indirect discourse. Things like uh, hooray, for example. It turns out that none of the indicators that points into the direction of free, indi free indirect discourse is found in the unembedded indirect discourse cases in ancient Greek. To the contrary, we do find indicators that point into the direction of indirect discourse. As we will show, definite descriptions in free indirect discourse are always protagonist-oriented, so interpreted from the character's perspective. Whereas in indirect discourse, they can be both uh, protagonist-oriented or narrator-oriented. This is an example of indirect discourse. Oedipus believed that his mother was not his mother. The sentence, in principle, has two readings. A, non a nonsensical reading, a protagonist-oriented reading, in which Oedipus believes in a contradiction. He believes, my mother is not my mother, the didactic reading. But the sen sentence has a second reading, a narrator-oriented reading, in which Oedipus believes of someone who the narrator calls his mother, that this person, but he thinks about her in terms of Jocasta, for example, that this person is not his mother. So then the phrase, his mother, does not originate from Oedipus, but from the narrator. Um, the free indirect discourse equivalent only has one reading, only this protagonist-oriented reading, so the nonsensical reading in which Oedipus believes in a contradiction. This means that if you find narrator-oriented readings of definite descriptions, it tells us that we have to do with indirect discourse and not with free indirect discourse. And indeed, we do find such readings in the unembedded indirect discourse cases in ancient Greek, indicating that we do not have to do with free indirect discourse there. This is an example. The report is introduced as follows. The Greeks tell the story as follows, and then we have an accusative with infinitive construction. And in this report, we get the expression, the islands that the Greeks call Eritaya. That phrase does not originate from the Greeks, but from Herodotus. The Greeks 
probably simply said the islands they probably simply said Eritrea. They may have said the islands that we call Eritrea, but not the islands that the Greeks call Eritrea. And we see um, the same with uh, proper names. We find in many places proper names where in free and direct discourse we would expect pronouns. So that indicates that while free and direct discourse patterns with direct discourse, unembedded indirect discourse is really a form of indirect discourse. And now Amar will present our semantic analysis in which you can see that it is really treated as a kind of indirect discourse. Yeah, so to, to, to give the analysis of this, this phenomenon, I first uh, look back and, and, and look at uh, German. There's a very similar phenomenon in German. Here's a, a, an example from the literature about it. Uh, so, uh, er sagte, sie sei schön, sie habe grüne Augen. So there's, this, uh, there's the uh, conjunctive mood, uh, a, 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 subjunct a, a subjunctive mood, a German subjunctive mood called the conjunctive. So he said she was beautiful, where the verb has this, this mood, conjunctive, and uh, then the, that means that he said that she was beautiful, just regular. And then there's, uh, it continues with the, with the next sentence, an independent main clause. She has green eyes, where has, it has this conjunctive mood. Um, and then the interpretation of that second sentence is not that she has green eyes, but that this, this person who is speaking there said uh, not only that she was beautiful, but he also said that she has green eyes. So it kind of picks up, it continues this, uh, this, uh, this report. So the, the conjunctive in a main clause indicates that it is being said by this salient speaker who we are talking about. And that's exactly what we see. It, it, it seems exactly the same as the pattern we see for the, look at the oblique optative in, in Greek. So what we'll be assuming is that there is a, a morpheme sub or sub, for subjunctive, the subjunctive morpheme, which gets spelled out in Greek as the optative mood and in, uh, in German as the conjunctive uh, uh, and gets spelled out on the verb as this mood. Um, and, 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 and syntactically or semantically, this is a sentential operator. So it takes scope over the sentence, just like mood typically does. So very simple, uh, uh, straightforward analysis of the syntax uh, and phonology of this, uh, this new morpheme. And then, so the puzzle for semantics, what's the challenge for semantics here is to define uh, uh, an interpretation of, or to define the contribution of this morpheme in such a way that these things all come out equivalent in this context. So the context, Mary was complaining about the meeting. I'm simplifying from the uh, green eyes example here. Um, so, so, and then you can continue with a sentence that says, uh, somebody left with subjunctive mood. And, uh, or you can say, she said that somebody left with subjunctive mood on, on, on left there. Or you can say, she said that somebody left uh, just regular. And all three, all three of these things mean that she, uh, Mary said that somebody left. So Mary was complaining about the meeting and Mary said that somebody left. That's the interpretation for all three of those things. So yeah, the, the challenge is simple to define the, uh, uh, what the, the subjunctive, what the interpretation of the subjunctive morpheme there. And then, so this is, this, this is the abstract morpheme that gets spelled out either as conjunctive in German or as um, optative. And we'll get back to the uh, accusative and infinitive later. So just the, the optative and the, and the conjunctive first. So this uh, will follow uh, basically the ideas of uh, Fabricius Hansen and Sebo uh, here. So let's take a walk you through a simple example. Uh, it's in DRT. So somebody left this, uh, gets this interpretation. Then we add this, uh, this subjunctive morpheme as a sentential operator. And that turns this, this, uh, this somebody left into this uh, strange presuppositional uh, DRS box. So the at issue content, what is, what is uh, contributed to the truth conditions here is uh, uh, um, this P and that's a propositional variable. I'm adding the type there, ST, to say that this is really a propositional variable. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, and, and uh, then there's a presupposition, that's this dashed box, where this, this P is presupposed to be said, and it's to be said by Y, who's also a presupposed speaker. 
and it's already and it's given that p is the proposition that somebody left. Okay, so if this is the whole sentence, so this this, this independent main clause with subjunctive marking, um, uh, then uh, at this point we want to do a presupposition resolution. So we, well, we first add the context. So the context was Mary was complaining about the meeting. There's the context. We merge these two things, uh, and we're going to look for antecedents for the presuppositions. So, um, well, first let's look for this, this Y presupposition, that is someone who is saying P, the, the proposition P. So this is regular indirect discourse saying, right? It's a relation between a person and a proposition. Um, well, who is someone who is saying? Well, that's probably uh, Mary, because we already said in the context that Mary's complaining. So Mary is likely to be the person who is saying something here. So Y is M. Um, and then, well, we have to look for an antecedent for this, for this propositional variable. Well, there's no, in the universe, there's no, there's no salient propositions that are being named and mentioned uh, uh, at all. So we'll have to accommodate this, this uh, proposition. So th there's no suitable antecedent in the universe there. There hardly ever will be. Um, so we have to accommodate this presupposition. And that means we just add it to the, uh, well, we project it and we add it to the, uh, the global representation. So then we get Mary's complaining and there's a proposition P, P uh, type ST, and Mary said uh, that P and P is the proposition that somebody left. Now this, this looks pretty good. This looks like what we wanted. We wanted to derive that it means Mary's complaining and Mary said that somebody left. So Mary said that P and P is the proposition that somebody left but we still have this thing here. And this is actually kind of strange. So we'll just stipulate that, uh, well, in the end, we have to clean up our DRSs and leave only things of type T, only statements. Every condition has to be a statement. This is not a, this is not a statement. This is just a loose proposition. Uh, so we'll just throw that out. It doesn't do any work anymore. So then we get the right reading. But we need it for... Uh, uh, so this is, this, is, this is admittedly a technical solution. It's, uh, you can, you, there's all kinds of ways. Fabricius Hansen and Sebo have a slightly different way to get rid of that P. But we need it to, to, uh, to uh, uh, derive uh, what happens when we embed the subjunctive morpheme. So somebody left with subjunctive morphology. Well, this is what we had before. And now we embed it under said that somebody left. So then we add just saying as a relation between an individual and a, a proposition. We can add this P, that's the at issue content. So that gets put in for the lambda Q. Then we get this. So the property of saying P, where P is presupposed to be said by Y, and P is presupposed to be the proposition that somebody left. So now, um, well, we have to continue. We have to continue constructing the sentence. Compositionally, we add Mary. Okay, so Mary said uh, that P, and P is presupposed to be said by someone. Um, and now, we can, now we're at sentence level, now we can start resolving presuppositions. So again, uh, we have to first look for who is the person who is saying something? Who is this Y? Well, there's someone salient in the context who is actually saying something. So presumably Y will be equated with M. So it's Mary who's saying uh, P. Uh, now, now we look again for a, 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 a salient uh, proposition in the universe. Well, again, there is no uh, uh, existential quantifi quantification over propositions there, so we'll have to accommodate the remaining uh, presupposition. Means we add it to the global representation. So there's, and then we are left with this. There's an M, that's Mary, and there uh, and and there's P, and Mary said that P twice, so uh, superfluous, and P is the proposition that somebody left. So this is the output, the same output that we had before. Then clean up that double thing. So Mary said that somebody, it just means Mary said the proposition that somebody left. So we're left with just a regular indirect discourse interpretation. And here you see why we needed the, uh, the intentional variable P. Okay, yeah. So that's, that's how, what, what, the, what the, the semantics of the subjunctive morpheme is. So to sum up, so the oblique optative, our analysis, at the, the logical form is a sentential operator, and it's phonologically sp uh, uh, spelled out as either optative or conjunctive morphology on the verb, and the semantics is, is this, uh, the, the, the DRS representation of subjunctive applied to phi is this 
presuppositional thing where you have here the representation of phi. Put that in there. Take the intention of it. Okay. Now, okay. Um, now we have to get back to the accusative and infinitive. So, um, so yeah, we want to we want to extend this analysis to cover these accusative and infinitive uh, 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 main clauses that are interpreted as uh, reports. So. Um, yeah, so the thing to note about uh, Greek and Latin also, uh, infinitival complements like the ACI, the accusative and infinitive, is that they're almost finite. That has to do with the fact that they have a very rich morphology, so there's lots of inflection. There's inflection for tense, for aspect, not for person, but... Uh, um, okay, so... Um, yeah, and that, that allows the infinitival complements to even have overt subjects, unlike in English, where they have to be prose. Um, so, all in all, this, these infinitival complements are by, assumed by syntacticians working on Latin, for instance, and also Greek, to be more like S than like VP, as in English. But, of course, they're not finite. They, they cannot, for instance, assign nominative case, which has to do with the fact that they, well, probably that the fact that they don't have person. So, we refer to the default case, and that's the accusative in these languages. So, that's why it's accusative for the subject, accusative and infinitive. Of course, infinitive doesn't have subject, and now we'll, all we have to do is assume that the infinitive morphology does not have a marker for mood. And then we can say that, well, basically, the logical form is the same. It's just somebody leave with infinitive, and then we add this subjunctive morpheme, but you just don't see it in the infinitive. There's a, in a way, there's an indicative subjunctive uh, syncretism in the infinitive that we assume. And if we assume that we get the right truth conditions and we also predict, for instance, that uh, uh, if you have an unembedded subjunctive that occurs in a stretch of text where it's not clear who is saying something, that's, up until now we've only had things where it's clear who was the person that is saying something, if there's no one, then we have to accommodate the subject there, the person who is saying something, and then we derive a generic reading. So somebody said that someone left. If you just utter this out of the blue with the, with the oblique optative or as an ACI. And we also see that in the actual text. So here's a, here's a text where you see an, an accusative and infinitive out of the blue, so to speak. It's not clear who is saying this. And then the interpretation that we predict for this stretch of text is that this means so he did this, allegedly, I am told. Someone said that he did this, and someone said that it occurred, and all these things are... Uh, it's an interpretation that's kind of like a hearsay evidential interpretation. So we make an actual prediction about how to read uh, uh, these texts. And now Corinne has a very short conclusion. The take-home message of our talk is this picture. And in particular, our claim that unembedded indirect discourse is not to be confused with what is traditionally misleadingly called free indirect discourse. I say misleadingly because free indirect discourse is not indirect discourse that is free. This is indirect discourse that is free, meaning syntactically not embedded. Um, this is free, but it's not indirect discourse. And once we have seen examples of this class, we have also obtained a clearer picture of what this is. Namely, th something that should not be analyzed as a case, um, as a kind of indirect discourse. It's important to see that this is not just a terminological point. Of course, we could invent a term that covers both this class and this class. Something like, um, not purely quotational, non-embedded speech and thought reports. But our point is that uh, that class would not be a semantically homogeneous class. Since free indirect discourse and unembedded indirect discourse are fundamentally different, free indirect discourse is quotational, directish, and unembedded indirect discourse is intentional. Indirect -ish. Um Let's now return to the question that Amar brought up at the very beginning of this talk. It's only one minute. <laughs> um, about the existence 
of free and direct discourse in ancient Greek. Of course, we have not proven that free and direct discourse does not exist in that language. It's uh, quite difficult to prove that something does not exist in a dead language. But we, <laughs> yeah. but we think that um, the fact that the people who claim that it does exist either do not provide examples themselves, they simply repeat what they have found in other people's work, or they give examples that are not cases of free and direct discourse, suggests to us that it probably doesn't exist. And we think that the burden of the proof is with the people who claim that it does exist. They should come up with clear examples. And we suspect that some scholars have encountered um, cases of unembedded indirect discourse and confused them with a superficially similar phenomenon, which is misleadingly called free indirect discourse. And what we have shown here is that on a closer look, the two are fundamentally different. That's it. you at all consider the possibility that an embedded indirect discourse is, is actually just embedded indirect discourse, except that involves ellipsis or more syntax analysis? Yeah, but... I, we could think, I could think of ways that you could sort of try to test if it's ellipsis. So, you know, if, if a discourse starts with a, an embedding verb, a matrix verb that is compatible only with the optative or only with the accusative with infinitive, and then see whether you have to be consistent with that throughout the text. Presumably that's a syntactic difference, right? Of selection and not a semantic one. Um, I don't know, I'm just... But wouldn't you expect if it's really ellipsis? Let me go back to these examples. Um, wait, sorry. If it's, it's really ellipsis in, in a strong sense of the word, that's... Here, for example, you would have a pronoun, since, or, yeah, you cannot. So I have another argument. So what we could look for is, so unfortunately, both Greek and German do not really have this word order test for whether it's embedded or not. So if it's elliptical, it would have embedded word order. Uh, so but, but you can't really see that because in German you have V2 for embedded things, so you wouldn't see that. But there is a remnant of this thing in Dutch where you have very clear word order distinctions between embedded and non-embedded. Uh, and it's the uh, zou, uh, so uh, ze zou mooie ogen hebben, so she had to, she, she have beautiful eyes with, with some kind of subjunctive marking. With, uh, um, and, and it also means reportedly she has, she has green eyes and it has just main clause word order. So if, th if that is the same phenomenon, which we have, that's just a suggestion, it seems to be, then, then that would also maybe be an argument. Yeah, in, in, in if you look at the behavior of particles, for example, there's gar somewhere here, a, a, a certain particle. Um, they are always in the second position of sentences. And it would be really strange if they would be in a embedded clause. In, yeah. Yeah. Um, just returning to this last example, I think in German you can't have that. Here, here the, the, um, the subject changes, right, from report to report, right, the implicit. I don't think in German this would work, but, you know, anyway. I, I have a question. Can, can you go through this, or can you, can you really point out exactly why you need this hack that you have a non-condition non, non in, the, in your list of conditions suddenly? That's... Yes, yes. I mean well, why you need it's like it? It's conceptually okay. you say I that in one case you have to accommodate and then the other yes, in the other yes. case you just I bind it and then, you know, why? But why the hell does it occur in the list of so conditions? Yeah, well, so we need it because at this point, if we fit, we, it's just for compositionality purposes. So at this point, we don't know if this is the whole sentence or if this is going to be embedded in a, in a saying. So if this is going to be embedded in the she said that, yeah. then this requires a propositional type uh, uh, subject, and then you need this thing, and then it works out. Right, right, but that was, there you don't need it. There you don't, so, so alternatively, you could say, well, this is, we, yeah, and that's, if, in fact, it's a way to say, well, it's sort of this, the same treatment, so we're pretending that this is really compositional, but actually, this P 
yeah, ultimately fulfills a slightly different purpose if it, if it is at main, at global level, or if it is, in the end, embedded. If it's embedded, then it really fulfills its function of a propositional variable, but if it ends up in the, in the global uh, context, if this is all a did sentence is, it will, have to, it will have to go because it cannot stay. So there, there is a hack necessary, I think. No, but but that's so. If you continue, then you end up with this. So what would this mean? So this means that Mary's complaining. But there is no pushing up anymore, is there? Okay, we we could we could remove it I mean, completely. Yeah, so there is some magic. We could. Okay, so then you're saying basically that the, the represent compositionally, you ha just don't have this. You just have the presupposition. Right. But that wouldn't work for the if you embed it. Then you can't embed that. There's no there's no at issue thing then anymore. If you have if you have if you have this, but without the p there. How can you apply this lambda term? Then, then you'd have to have a hack there. So there is some kind of hack necessary. So it's just to, to treat the two in a uniform way. In an apparently uniform way, yeah. maybe. <laughs> 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 to be completely honest, maybe. Yeah, so there is some hack necessary. It, it behaves differently and there is... Uh, there is some bookkeeping, right. Yeah, so what, what, what Fabrice Hunt and Shell Johan do, they define it. They hide it a little bit more, maybe more cleverly. They hide it in the definition <laughs> of the plus. They say it disappears <laughs> when, you, when you plus it. <laughs> is that, is that <laughs> yeah. so, um, I had a question about something uh, different, which is looking at the, like the example one, um, have you looked at the factors that determine when you stop using this uh, whatever the optative or the infinitive mm -hmm. or whatever is. So for instance, you, you know, when the example says they came to Argos and then that's in the whatever the relevant mood is, the infinitive, but then in the next sentence, the Phoenicians came to Argos and that looks like it is not in one of oh, these Oh no, it's, it's, it's still the infinitive with accusative uh, construction, but all the fa verbs that look um, uh, finite in the translation are actually participles in ancient Greek. But they are, since they, um, yeah, they are in the accusative case as well, so belonging uh, to the accusatives that belong to the infinitives. All right. So, so, yeah. so the more the more general question is, I guess, what um, is it strictly a fact about the syntax that determines that difference, or is it something reflective of the way the narrative is developing, or about the uh, status of that information once it's introduced? See? Um, do you mean the difference between the participles and the infinitives, or yeah. between the that one? Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a whole lot to say about participles in ancient Greek. Um, actually, they look like um, they look very finite, just like the infinitives. So these two behave very differently from participles in modern languages. Um, yeah, for ex they have. They really can introduce new information that uh, develops the storyline forward, whereas that's strange in, in English or Dutch or German. There is always information that is at least predicted um, or inferable from what is said so far. Um, but I think that whatever it is that um, determines when you use a, a, a participle or a finite verb in ancient Greek in general, whatever that mechanism is, is exactly the same in the infinitival constructions. So the, the difference between the participle and the infinitives in these kind of structures it seems to be the same as the difference between the participles and the indicative yeah, person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I like this connection that you drew between um, unembedded indirect discourse in Greek and the conjunctive in, in German, and it seems as though there's, there's 
something right about this idea that what they have in common is sort of licensing of mood or, or the infinitive or whatever it may be across a sentence boundary by an attitude predicate. And I wondered if you'd thought about another phenomenon that might be possibly you could handle with the same apparatus, namely logophoric pronouns in West African languages or um, long distance and Afro in languages like Tamil, where again you have an element that normally would need to be licensed by an attitude verb, but it can be that licensing can happen across a sentence boundary. Do you think that this could be the same, the same type of thing that we're seeing? Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's uh, yeah, if that really happens across the sentence boundary, that's right. Yeah, we, hadn't, we haven't think, thought about that, but it could be that there's, but we'd have to have some kind of sentential operator. So we'd have to say that the, the, the logophoric morphology is an effect, is a spell out of a sentential operator, but I guess that's, that's, that is possible, yeah. Yeah, it could be. But or I, mean the I mean, the connection between logophoric pronouns and, and the conjunctive lines has been drawn over and yeah, over and yeah, over yeah, again yeah, anyway, yeah. so it's sort of tempting to make that move. Mm -hmm. yeah. But aren't logophoric pronouns always related to a really first-person perspective, whereas our claim for these cases is that it's not necessarily this first-person perspective? It's, yeah, it's, it's, but it's in interesting in to... In addition to, I think, maybe... So you also need something extra for logophoric mm -hmm. pronoun, to logophoristy, but also the fact that it is being, that if it's across the sentence boundary and that it's still interpreted as being said or thought, that would be the connection, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. could maybe derive from this kind of mechanism. Yeah. 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 So it's sort of mortal subordination-like mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so I noticed that um, in your Greek examples, you always had a verb of saying, which was either explicitly mentioned or implied. And uh, this was also reflected in your account, which had a say verb in the presuppositional part. Um, yeah. And from what I know, free and direct discourse does not necessarily involve uh, uh, verbs of saying. Yeah. It's very often like thought or Yeah, that something. is a different. That so is, that is a, big a difference. clear difference with yeah. something that you can point out and, you know, as an, another argument that this is not yeah. a typical case of free and direct discourse. Absolutely. Yeah, there are a few examples about which you are not sure whether it's thought or said, but the general picture is that's really reports of utterances. Yes, that's, that's a big difference. Thanks. So I'm, uh, to follow up on Carlos's question, so I'm, I'm still curious about whether there's sort of a syntactic sense in which these sentences are actually embedded. Um, and I'm wondering if you looked at, uh, so, you know, there, there are other markers besides just word order, which might, uh, you know, other kinds of things which can only happen in root transformations, say, in root clauses traditionally. So, you know, like English neg inversion, right, that, that kind of mm -hmm. construction. But also commonly in many languages, certain kinds of topicalization um, in uh, embedded contexts are bad. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, if you looked at any other sort of more syntactic markers like that to see if yeah. these are, tr you know, to try to make a case that these are really unembedded. Yeah. yeah, word order is relatively free, so that's a problem. Well, it's of course not free. It's not really free, but it's more mostly de determined by information structure. So that is that is a complicating factor in doing that kind of stuff. But yeah, we would love to make that point of the talk stronger. Could I follow up on that really quick? Is that okay? Um, so al alternatively, right, um, I'm wondering, so unless I completely misunderstood something, right, I'm, w I'm wondering if there are cases where you have, uh, you know, other, c other, you know, normal mood sentences in between different instances which are uh, going, that sort of are reported speech of this construction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so the, I, the, the question I'm trying to get at is, you know, could these, although they're orthographically written as independent clauses, actually be a continuation of some large, you know, block which structurally is all embedded? Mm -hmm. um, does that make sense? It does. Um, yeah, I think, but I need to check it, but I, I really believe that I've seen examples where there is a a finite clause in between, so not a participle in that case, but really a finite clause. And then he switches, so that's one something that's 
uh, Herodotus wants to com commit himself to, and then he goes back to the report. So yeah, th that would maybe be the cases that you are looking for. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.